Well, beloved, my inspiration from this came from a Google search early in the week. So this is going to be a really geeky sermon. So just, just bear with me on this. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When J.K. Rowling wrote the, the Harry Potter series, she had no idea what she was getting herself into. Uh, as of 2013, there are 120 million copies of her books in print in the U.S., 450 million copies in print throughout the world, translated into 73 languages, and sold in 200 different territories, which makes it one of the most wide-reaching series of books um, behind the Bible uh, ever, ever produced and translated into more languages. You know, she never knew what a powerful story she was writing and how many people would be interested in it. I mean, if if you look it out there now, the the fandom out there with, you know, merchandising and conventions and even a subgenre of rock and roll called wizard rock, or even Quidditch, which, you know, looks like something you shouldn't be able to do as a muggle, but you can. Um, Brendan just got finished doing a week of Quidditch uh, as as part of the Parks and Rec program. Um, The International Quidditch Association has over a thousand teams, and the Quidditch World Cup last year drew 80 collegiate teams from 36 states and four nations. It's one of the fastest growing sports in the world. Obviously, Harry Potter has touched some sort of cultural cornerstone, some sort of spiritual cornerstone. It's a ruling myth of our time. The generation that's now entering the workplace literally grew up with Harry Potter. If you've read the books, you know they start off as fairly kind of standard children's literature and then become much more complex and dark as they go along. She literally felt like J.K. Rowling was writing to that generation of kids as they grew up uh, until they get to the point that uh, book seven is, is pretty much adult literature, I would say. Um, they became more and more complex. And so this has become something that this entire generation is going to be formed from for the rest of their lives. Now, you often hear the criticism from Christian corners of, well, gosh, they like Harry Potter, but why can't they like Jesus? You know, this, there's, there's this incredibly compelling story of Jesus as well. It's, it's an incredibly powerful story. Well, I think I can answer that even from my own experience, not, not having grown up with Harry Potter. Um, you know, I grew up in, in South Central Kentucky, where the voices that I, you know, I, and I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up as, as a Christian. Um, I, re, I knew the stories of Jesus. I had read the gospel accounts, so I knew what Jesus had taught. But none of the voices I heard talking about Jesus seemed to be saying anything remotely similar to what he had said. They'd say strange and, 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 and objectionable things that didn't seem to have any relation to the, the Jesus I read in the Gospels. These faces, for me, were obscuring Christ. They were making it impossible to hear the story. Uh, almost to the point of, this is one of my favorite pieces of pop art. You know, um, There are so many people in the world who are drawn to Jesus, who are drawn to Jesus' teachings, but they can't get past the way his followers act. You know, this, is, this is a problem that we run into constantly as Christians in the world. Uh, even people outside our own tradition have noticed this. A famous quote by Gandhi, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So how did I find my way in? Well, there are several stories about that, but one of the most compelling for me was reading C.S. Lewis. You know, I, as, as a preteen, I read the Chronicles of Narnia series, and I remember reading that, and I, I didn't know enough about Christian allegory to be able to figure out that's what was going on. But I, I, I read that, and I knew that Aslan was some sort of a god figure. Some sort of a god figure. And I said, gosh, that's an awesome god figure. I wish that the god that the Christians proclaimed was something like that. You know, that's how far I had beca- I'd gotten divorced. Of course, years later, you find out that C.S. Lewis was writing a straightforward allegory and that this is a, a portrayal of Jesus in a different form. And Lewis had the same problem when he was a young man. This is not when he was a young man. Um, but his problem was that he read all these different myths. Um, he read all these myths about um, the different gods, and almost every mythology has, a, has, a, has some sort of a legend about a god that dies and rises again. It's a fairly common thing in mythology. And he said, well, they've all got the same thing, so Christianity is just one of a thousand different myth systems. Why should I believe that? His friend J.R.R. Tolkien said, 
That's true. They all have that mythology. But nobody has ever said that they actually saw Balder, the Norse god who died and rises again every spring. No one has actually said that they ever saw um, Osiris. Hmm, moved ahead there. Yeah. Um, no one has ever actually said that they saw Osiris. Jesus is a real historical person. Jesus is the myth. All these other myths are, are, are true in the fact that this kind of thing happens. But it's, it's the fact that Jesus became that myth made flesh that, drag, that draws all those others in. And in addition, we, as writers of fiction, because both Tolkien and Lewis and several others were part of a group that worked together and read each other's stories to each other, when we create something as Christians, we are sub-creating, because we're made in the image of God, we make in the image of God. So when we create something, we're doing it as Christians, and it, it, it has that value within it. Um, and look, uh, Tolkien was really careful about that. He said, you know, one of the most amazing things about the Lord of the Rings, if you read it, is there's no religion in it at all. And Tolkien said, that's because if I had put it in there, it would have gone the wrong direction. It's... It's infused with it. It's infused with his very, very devout, devout Catholicism. And I would maintain that Harry Potter is the same way. This quote, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, from our gospel today, is very important in the Harry Potter series. Um, this is, I'm going to show you a three-minute video. If you haven't seen the movies, this probably won't make a lot of sense. But if you have, you'll get it. Um, but the, the point is... Um, that this is a fan-made video. So this is somebody, just somebody out there who's, who's taking this quote and making a video that goes along with it.
when the Harry Potter books first came out, there was a lot of questioning in Christian circles about, you know, what is this? Is, is, is it good? Is it satanic? You know, there's witchcraft and all this kind of stuff going on. But as the series went on, a lot of that died out. And it's because the themes became more and more clear. And then when the seventh book came out and these two scripture verses presented themselves as kind of some of the central themes uh, that Rowling says are the themes of her books a lot of that opposition went away the first one is this one of where your treasure is there will your heart be also and something you should be able to get from that video whether you know anything about the series or not is if you think about the Harry Potter series you know there's dragons there's there are giants there are all sorts of incredible visual images but when this person who is steeped in the Harry Potter more mythology puts together this video, it's only pictures of the people, pictures of the characters. The characters are so compelling, and most of those characters you see are dead by the end of the books. J.K. Rowling uh, kills off more of her characters than anybody other than George R. R. Martin, who writes the Game of Thrones series. Um, but uh, showing the price of resisting evil, it's very, very um, important about that. So the treasure, as Rowling puts it in her books, is that the treasure is in community. It's in the people around you that love you. Harry Potter is actually rich by almost anybody's standards, but it's the people around him that he's truly rich in. The other quote that comes up in the Harry Potter series, both of these are on gravestones, actually, is uh, on his mother and father's gravestone. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. By the end of the books, it becomes very clear, no spoilers here, hopefully, but by the end of the books, it becomes very clear that Potter has to die in order to destroy the evil in the world, that he has to make a decision whether to save his own life or to give it for the good of the world. Um, So, you know, there's that parallel that's pretty obvious, too. And Rowling was asked about this. I mean, she's a member of the Church of Scotland. um, And to her, she, she said, to me, the religious parallels have always been obvious, but I never wanted to talk too openly about it because I thought it might show people who just wanted to, store, to, to watch the story where we were going. She said, if I was open about this, people might get disinterested and walk away. She's showing the story. It's the same story that we have with Christ or the same story that we see in parts of the Lord of the Rings or in Narnia, just through a new set of eyes so a new generation can see it, if only we recognize it that way. So whether the face is that of Aslan, and I honestly think I never would have come to know Jesus without Aslan, or if if it's the face of Frodo, or if it's the face of Harry Potter, the face that stands behind them is the face of Jesus, if only we will step forward and recognize it. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And our treasure needs to be in the stories that teach us how to live lives of goodness and faithfulness. Amen.